Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We'll be starting in a few minutes. As usual, our operating time is between three and four. I'm not able to keep <clears throat> all the, the sessions at a fixed time. Uh, so I hope you are all not finding it too difficult to keep track. Anyway, um, Zabiba from Singapore, welcome, salam alaikum, Don Parker, wa alaikum salam, Apple Jean from Philippines, Mashfiq from Bangladesh, Saida from the UK, from Bahrain we have Igles, Mohammed Mohsen from Ghana, Assalamu alaikum, welcome, inshallah. Saeed Saidov from Kuala Lumpur, good to see you again. Barakalafik. Don Parker from Washington, D.C. MashaAllah, welcome. Barakalafik. Tamika Walker from the USA. Joy from India. Asad Khan from India. And Park Sang So from Philippines, welcome. Shihab, Shihabuddin from Bangladesh, one of our regulars, Hussein Mo from Minnesota. And Missouri, we have Alva Zahra, mashallah. Okay, let's get moving now, inshallah. Ami Queen from the United Kingdom. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salam ala rasulihi al-kareem wa ala alihi wa ashabi wa man istanna bi sunnatihi ila yawm al-deen This is our 19th session of the series in the names of Allah all praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on his last Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. In this session, the 19th session, we will be looking at two names, name number 25 and name number 26, Ar-Razzaq and Ar-Raziq. These are the two names we'll be looking at. Loosely translated, Ar-Razaq as the continual provider and Ar-Raziq as the provider. Not too many um, alternative names that fit the Arabic implications. Anyway, uh, in the Quranic, in terms of Quranic location, the divine name Ar-Razaq is mentioned only once by itself in the Quran. In Allah, huwa razaqu dhul quwwatil mateen. Indeed, Allah is the continual provider, the firm possessor of strength in Surah Dhariyat, verse 58. Ibn Muhaysin, uh, one of the uh, narrators of the Qiraat, the different variants, variant readings of the Qur'an, uh, who was in Mecca, based in Mecca, he, in the same verse he read it as Ar-Raziq. That is, in Allah huwa raziqu dhul quwwatil mateen. So, and others read according to that recitation also. The divine name 
Ar-Razik is mentioned in the plural form five times in the Quran. We don't find it in the singular form, except in that recitation of Ibn Muhaysin. So we'll find, for example, uh, as an example, وَرْزُقْنَا وَأَنْتَ خَيْرُ الرَّازِقِينَ We ask Allah there, وَرْزُقْنَا provide for us as you are the best of providers. Well, the best of providers, is that's, that's the plural form, رَازِقِينَ which we see here. That was in Surah Al-Ma'idah. However, Ar-Raziq, clearly as a name of Allah, can be found in the authentic Sunnah. Uh, in a hadith narrated by Anas ibn Malik, he quoted uh, an incident which took place in the Prophet's time. The people in the marketplace had said to the Prophet O Messenger of Allah, prices have shot up, so fix the prices for us. So the Prophet ﷺ replied, In Allah huwa al musa'ir, al qabid, al basit, al raziq. Uh, so he described the law saying, Allah is the one who fixes prices, al musa'ir, who withholds, al qabid. who gives lavishly al and who provides continually al-raziq so the name is established from both the quran the names were established from both the quran and the sunnah we are certain that these are among the names of allah linguistically the two divine names are derived from the noun root rizq which fundamentally means what has been apportioned, which is beneficial for you. Razak, continual provider, is the intensive form of the participle Raziq, as we saw before in Ghafar and uh, Khalaq, etc. Relative to Allah, this divine name, Razak, means that he is the one who creates your rizq and takes it upon himself to deliver what he has apportioned to his servants. Because he is a raziq and a razaq, he provides this sustenance to everyone, Muslim and non-Muslim, woman and man, humans and animals, insects and plants. His provision encompasses every living being on earth. Allah says in the Quran, in this regard, وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا Allah is responsible for the provision of every creature on earth. Surah Hud. Now the reality of rizq, you know, we said it was provision which has been apportioned. And what we usually think in terms of risk when this term is used is mainly wealth. The house you have, the car you have, whatever are the possessions of this world. This is what we tend to look at as risk. However, as it can be money, Yes, it could be money, it could be a house, it could be a car, it could be property of different forms. But it can just as well be emotionally beneficial incidents or accidents like marriage, graduation, a job well done, etc., which give us a sense of well being and contentment. This is part of the risk. Likewise, it could also be spiritual risk or provision. 
The person who takes it upon himself or herself to attend talks, listen to programs, surrounds themselves with good people and strives to do more and more good, such people feed their souls with spiritual provisions, which helps them to grow closer to God, and Allah will raise their station because of it. So the risk doesn't have to be just something tangible which you can put your hands on. It can be intangibles of inner well-being, happiness, etc., etc. Now, if we move on to the principles of Ibn Battal, the four principles for application of the divine name. We said the first was to adopt where applicable, where the name has uh, human intentions or, or dimensions, then we try to apply that name ourselves. As we said before, when Allah described himself as being merciful, most merciful, ever merciful, we said we can live it, adopt it by being merciful ourselves. And the Prophet ﷺ gave us enough uh, encouragement that if we are not merciful, then we cannot expect mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So similarly here, one of the, since the name talks about Allah providing provision for us, similarly, we who Allah has given ample provision should likewise strive to be God's instrument to provide provisions for others in this world. So we're talking about charity that we give, we provide, especially in this month, the month of Ramadan, in which Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was known to be most generous. He encouraged us to adopt these names and be providers for Allah. One, he did so by removing our fear of poverty assuring us, saying charity does not decrease wealth in the least. This is in Sahih Muslim. It increases it, in fact. So that fear of being charitable, our money has decreased, that's how it appears. We had 100, now we only have 50. We gave away 50, that leaves 50. But reality that that 50 left behind has increased in its value, has increased in its value more than the hundred which you had before. He also encouraged us by promising us paradise. He said, found in Sahih Bukhari, save yourselves from hell by giving even a half a date in charity. If you only gave a half a date in charity, if that's all you had to give and you gave it, it will save you from hell. It's a means of saving you from hell, of course, with the right intention and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. We know of a well-known hadith of Aisha where you know a woman came to her with her two ch two children, maybe I think it was two daughters, like if I'm not mistaken. And um, uh, she had some dates, uh, or maybe it was Aisha who gave her what she had from what she had, she gave her, you know, like three dates. So she was gonna give each one of them one. But then after she gave to the two daughters, the two of them ate it up right away. And the one that she was keeping for herself to eat, the daughters were still looking at her with this date. So she split the date in half and gave it to her daughters. When the Prophet ﷺ was informed, when Aisha went and informed the Prophet ﷺ later what took place, the Prophet ﷺ said she will be among the people of paradise. Of course, this is knowledge from Allah, which is given to the Prophet Sallallahu But that act, that charitable act on her part, giving, providing for her daughters at her own expense, taking that date, cutting it in half, that was enough to make her 
among the people of paradise. It might seem like something simple, but Allah knows best that that was a test for her. How hungry she was at that point when she gave it up for her children. The Prophet also assured us of God's provision by giving ourselves. He quoted Allah as saying, O son of Adam, spend in charity and I will spend on you. Spend in charity and I will spend on you. That's Allah's promise through the Prophet And he also advised us saying, give in charity and don't give reluctantly. So Allah will only give you a little in return. So we apply the name initially by trying to give as much as we can as Allah gives to all of his creatures we should likewise give to those who we can one of the point that needs to be considered however when we're talking about uh, the risk and the receiving is that risk in, 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 in its fundamental form is different from hiba. We talked about in al-Wahhab, the name al-Wahhab, which came from hiba, hibatun. You know, hiba is a gift, whereas rizq we translate as provision. It's a gift from Allah. The provision is a gift from Allah. But the difference is that risk is written for you. But in order for you to unlock the door of risk, you need to work. As if your risk depended on how hard you try. Right? You need to work as if your risk, knowing that if the, you, you know in your heart that the more you try, the more risk you're likely to get, then you have to make that effort in a similar way. The hiba from Allah being al-wahhab, that just comes. That's just a gift. You didn't deserve it, you deserved it or whatever, it has come. But the risk you have to work for. And of course it's written, but Allah writes it with the issue of the effort that you make regarding to it. You, you, you know at the same time that whatever comes is what Allah has written for you. But the issue is, how was it written? Was it written as something just magically appearing? Or is it written as something that you made an effort for and you got it? This is the point. And, you know, when we look at the case of Hajar, the wife of Prophet Abraham, who was left in the desert in the area which became Mecca, and the efforts she made, he left her in the desert, and she asked him, did your Lord command you to do this? You know, she had a doubt here, what's going on? Did your Lord command you to do this? Prophet Abraham said, yes. This is the command of my Lord. She said, fine. I trust in him. He left her with a little water or whatever. Of course, the water runs out. And what does she do? She goes to Safa, Mount Safa, goes to Mount Marwa. She's checking to see if there are any caravans passing by, etc., so that she can get some water. And she continues to do that until Allah causes the spring of Zamzam to begin right there near where he, she left her son Ishmael. Uh, and uh, that's history. That's part of our Hajj. It's expressed also even in our Umrah. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that 
She made that effort, effort. And even the going back and forth is called sa'i. This sa'i, it, it, it refers to striving to go do something, making an effort. Yeah. So that is an example for us, uh, which is worth reflecting on when we're thinking about risk and what we deserve and what we need, etc. The second principle of Ibn Battal was to confirm this name or these names where they are unique and inapplicable. We confirm them. We cannot do as Allah does. We cannot be Ar-Razzaq or even Ar-Raziq. We can't be that in the complete sense. So what we need to do is to affirm how those names operate in our daily lives and how that should then motivate us to live. So for example, with Allah providing risk, we know it's coming from him. He's a raza, he's a raza. Then it means we know that it is not necessary for us to seek haram risk because the risk that he's bringing to us is the halal. Don't consider that an opportunity for haram comes and there's big risk with it, you say, okay, this is my risk. No, that's not your risk. That's your hellfire. Your risk is the halal. And as long as we know that Allah is going to provide, then we stay away from the haram. Now, of course, there may be circumstances where uh, you are forced and the Sharia recognizes uh, what they call the dururat, the forced circumstances, where you need a heart operation and nobody's willing to pay for it, it's too costly, etc. So you go to the bank, you take out a loan to save your life. That much you did to try to save your life. Okay. Allah can excuse that. However, once your life has been saved, you pay off your loan. You don't bother to take this now as an open door for you. You know, something else you need to do. Oh, okay. Let me go back to the bank again. No, that was necessary to save your life. Anything beyond that now becomes clearly haram. So, if we truly believe that whatever provisions that have been written for us will come to us, then we should know that we do not need to seek forbidden ways of making a living, like working in a bank, housing our families, like taking out a mortgage, starting our own businesses, by like taking out loans, which are interest loans, we don't need to do this. Instead, we will patiently and humbly work in whatever halal way that we can in a manner which befits us as Muslims, knowing that it is Allah who will ultimately provide for us when the time is right. Even if everyone around you is engaging in disobedience and rebellion against Allah's laws. You don't follow suit simply because that's not an excuse. Well, everybody else was doing it, you know, that's what you hear people saying. Everybody else was doing that. So we felt it was okay. No, you know it is haram, leave it. Confirming these na names, <coughs> these divine names, Raziq and Ar-Razzaq, should also bring about contentment in our lives. 
with what Allah has given us. We should not harbor any resentment or bitterness towards Allah for not giving us what we want or feel that we need. Because this happens to people all the time. You know, they say, why, why has Allah abandoned me, you know? You know, I've been good, I, I did the right things and so and so, you know, why am I not getting this thing that I need or this thing that I want? Or whatever? Come on. Allah is a razak. If he has provided for you, it's what you need. It may not be what you want, but it's what you need. So instead, what we should be doing is being thankful for what we have and not allow our failures, etc., to cause us to turn against Allah or rebel against Allah. You know, this is ignorance. Instead, we should be content with what Allah has written for us and what we have is more than enough. Believe that, that what we have is more than enough. The Prophet ﷺ reminded us of the, the need for this kind of contentment in a statement in which he, which he made, found in the Tirmidhi, whoever wakes up safely in his home, physically healthy, and has provisions for the day, would have acquired all of the worldly possessions he is in need of. Whoever wakes up safely in his home, he's in safety. How many people in the world wake up and they're not in safety? Their homes are bombarded, people are breaking in. Also. So you wake up safely in your home. You're physically healthy. How many people are healthy? How many people are sick? And you have provisions for the day. You know where your next meal is coming from. That would be of provisions, all that you need. That you've covered everything. All the bases are covered. We should avoid being among people whom Allah describes saying, among people is he who worships Allah according to the letter. Find the letter of the book. If he's touched by good, he is reassured by it. And if he's struck by trial, he turns his face away from Allah. He has lost both this world and the hereafter. That is manifest lost. We're not right on the edge, going, can go this way or can go that way. If it's not exactly as it is in the book, or we only do exactly what it says, exactly, no more, no additional, like the Bedouin who would come to the Prophet and asked, uh, what is Islam? And he explained to him what Islam was. And, you know, and then he went on to explain after each uh, pillar of Islam, he would say, for example, after Salah, he'd say, well, you know, there's also voluntary prayers before and after. And the man said, oh, I'll just do exactly what you asked me to do. That's what I'll stick with. Voluntary, no, let me just stay with what is required. And then the Prophet ﷺ went on to uh, fasting and same thing. Every time the voluntary is mentioned, he would say, no, 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 I'll just stick with that. Then after the Prophet ﷺ completed the picture, the man said, that's it? He said, yeah, okay, turn to walk away. He said, he said I'll do that exactly. No more, no less. I'll just do that, exactly what you prescribed. And he turned and walked away. The Prophet ﷺ, the other companions were looking at him. The Prophet ﷺ said, if he's truthful, he's got paradise. Okay, if he's truthful, he's got paradise. Reality is that to do it exactly, just exactly what is required, 
Who does that? Who is actually able to do that? Hardly anybody. Hardly anybody. That's why the voluntary acts are there. Because when Allah asks about our prayers, he asks first and foremost about the fard prayers. If there are deficiencies in the fard, he asks about the sunnah. Sunnah makes up for what is deficient in the fard. Prayers, fasting, hajj, zakah, everything. Same way. So we shouldn't, you know, put down the sunnah the voluntary acts of worship, feeling confident we're just going to do the fard, the wajib, what is exactly required. That's a dangerous place to be. You know, you're walking on the knife's edge. You could slip off any time. So this is why the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to do voluntary acts of worship. Now, the third principle of Ibn Battal was that of having hope where there is a promise. In the divine names, if there is a promise either open or subtle, implied, then we should have hope about what is being promised. So the divine names are Razak and Razik. They are in and of themselves a promise of provision for everyone, understood especially by those who are conscious of Allah and put their full trust in Him. They have real hope in these names of Allah, which doesn't shake and crumble at the first sign of failure. So they have tawakkul. Reliance on Allah. As Allah had said, whoever relies on Allah, then he is sufficient for him. That is sufficient. Allah is sufficient for his affairs if he relies on Allah. Similarly, that if you are grateful, Allah will increase your provision. He'll increase his favor on you in whatever you're grateful for. So these are promises that Allah has given in the Quran, which relate back to the rizq that we all seek in all of its forms. As we said, rizq not limited only to materials. The fourth principle was that of having fear where there is a warning. Fundamentally, there is no warning in these two divine names. So we should not fear losing our risk because Allah is a razzaq. Grant, he grants provisions to everybody, whether we are good or bad, kind or unkind, a miser or a pauper, our allotted portion in this world will reach us. However, if we do not use our provision properly, it will become a curse on us on the day of judgment. On that day, we will be asked about all that was given to us and how we used it. Were we thankful? Did we use it to worship Allah? by using it in ways which are pleasing to him? Or did we use it in ways which were displeasing? Did we violate his commands? Did we disobey him with those provisions? If they were, then we will be punished because of them. Because with every favor, every portion of risk which comes to us, there is responsibility. It's not just given to us and more is coming. Yes, he's a razak, so more is coming. But is it given and it doesn't matter how we use it? Of course not. Allah is just and he's wise. So we should not fool ourselves into believing that 
No problem, there's more where that came from. No. There may be and there may not be. Because Allah is al qabil He's the one who holds things back too. You know, he gives and he also withholds. So don't be sure simply because things are going well right now. As a last point, we'd like to look at how to increase risk because of course that's the big concern. How can we make get more? How can we get additional risk? You know? And some of them we've touched already in what we've discussed, but we can uh, put them in a list here. Say number one is consciousness of Allah, having that consciousness. And that's called taqwa. That's what this month of Ramadan is all about. In order for us to develop that consciousness of Allah. So Allah said, whoever has taqwa of Allah, he will make for him a way out. Whoever fears Allah, Allah will get an exit for him. And he will be provided for him where he didn't even expect it. This is provision will come to him with taqwa. Second is tawakkal, or reliance on Allah. Allah says in the Quran also, whoever relies upon Allah, then he's sufficient for him. We mentioned that earlier. Also, keeping good relations with the family. Prophet Muhammad said, whoever would like his risk to be increased, this is clear, and his life to be extended, should uphold the ties of kinship. Should uphold family ties. Very important. Prophet put so much weight on family ties. He, in one time, in one occasion, he he, he said that that you know, لا يدخل الجنة قطع. One who breaks family ties will not enter paradise. Ooh, that is so heavy. That is so heavy. You know, people ask me all the time. You know, my parents, my family, my uncles, my aunts, my brother, my brothers, sisters, whatever. You know, they're this and they're that and they're the other and so on and so on. So can I just cut ties? Can I just not have anything to do with them, please? Is that possible? Is that halal? Can I? No, it's not halal. You should maintain the ties. Okay, you can minimize your contact to minimize the harm that is coming from the contact, etc. But cutting ties, no more. They don't hear from you, period. That's it. You live your lives, they live their lives. No. You want to go to paradise? You want to increase your risk? Then keep those ties in place. And then thankfulness, we said, gratitude, which is taught to us 17 times a day in our daily prayers, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. All gratitude, all thanks is due to you, Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. Allah made us repeat that 17 times a day, over and over again. And we should reflect on it. We should reflect on it. We talked about sujood ashukr in our previous session. Sujood ashukr, giving thanks to Allah, being thankful. Well, that can increase the risk. As Allah said, la in shakartum. If you are thankful, I will increase my favor on you. Also asking forgiveness and repentance. Prophet Sallam had said, ask forgiveness from your Lord 
sorry, not the Prophet Sallallahu this is from Quran. Allah said, ask forgiveness of your Lord. Indeed, he is a perpetual forgiver. He will send rain from the sky upon you in continuing showers and give you increase in wealth and children and provide for you gardens and provide for you rivers. This is all that's coming if you seek forgiveness of Allah. Giving in charity, we already spoke about that. Allah increasing what you have given. You want increase, you want more, then give. Reciting the Quran, the Prophet has said the house in which the Quran is recited is increased in good and the house in which the Quran is not recited is decreased in good. That's straightforward. You want more good in the home, benefits, risk, etc. Read the Quran regularly in the home. But reading the Quran, remember, is reading the Quran with understanding. Not just reading the letter. You know, do not be that one who worships Allah ala harf on a single letter, right on the edge. You just read the letter. So you read through the Quran, one khatam, one completion, two, three, four, and you figure big rewards should be coming. Let me carry on with whatever else I have to do. No, that's not the way. The Quran, Allah says from the very beginning, is what? Hudan lil muttaqeen. Guidance for those who are conscious of Allah. This is the purpose of reading the Quran, to be guided. So if we're reading the Quran and there is no guidance coming, all we're doing is repeating the Arabic letters and words. There's no understanding coming. Believe that there is no reward in it. You know yourself. Everybody, all of us know. If somebody gave you a book written in Italian using English letters, Roman letters, English letters, or French, or Spanish, because they're just like English. They have the same kind of writing. So you can read these. You may be mispronouncing them or whatever, but you can read it. Can you imagine yourself reading your way through a book in letters which could be pronounced, not understanding a single word of it? Of course, you're going to say, that is stupidity. That is an act of stupidity. A waste of time, pointless, meaningless, foolish, ah, no end of descriptions. So then what? So then what? Then we pick up the Quran, we read it in Arabic and not understand a single word of it. After saying all of that, we come and we do the same thing, we parrot the Quran. So my advice, brothers and sisters, this is the month of the Quran, Ramadan, in which the Quran was revealed. The Prophet ﷺ did not command us to read through the whole Quran in Ramadan. He didn't. Read Quran is good. It's a good thing. And the Prophet ﷺ, he used to complete it, but the Sahaba, they read. Remember, that when a Sahabi memorized Surah Al-Baqarah, he was called Hafiz. That's what they, the title they gave him. He was a guardian of the Quran. Surah Al-Baqarah. So if, believe me, if you read Surah Al-Baqarah with understanding, you have the translation beside you. After you've read a verse, you read the meaning. Or you have it 
verse in Arabic on top, your language below. So as you're reading it, you're understanding. Believe that that is a thousand times better than what you're doing now. Just vocalizing the Arabic text and you don't know what you're reading. What is Allah telling you? Allah may be cursing you and you are reading it enthusiastically. You don't even know. So recite the Quran in your home because the home in which the Quran is recited is increased in good but recite it with understanding. That's where the good is going to come. There is overall good, and then there is good direct from the product of your efforts. And lastly, of these list of things that we can do to increase our risk is migrating for the sake of Allah. If you're living in a place, which is corrupt. Islam is weak. Muslims are suffering, whatever it's once so. And you are able to leave and go elsewhere, then you should go elsewhere. Allah mentions it in the fourth chapter, verse 100. And whoever emigrates for the cause of Allah will find on the earth alternative locations and abundance. They will find abundance. Allah will provide. And Muslims traditionally left. Even if their places were not necessarily um, bad or corrupt, etc. But they, they left as traders. Many of them were traders. They went around the world. But also they have, from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu made hijra. They made hijra to Habasha, where I am now. And they made hijra to Medina, the first and the second hijras. And they found protection, support, and abundance. And that is until Yom al a principle which remains as a part of the Sunnah, the recommended Sunnah of the Prophet So in closing, how can we call on Allah using these names? We can say, Ya Razak, or Ya Razak. Of course, Ya Razak is stronger. Give us contentment in what you have provided for us. And bless us to use it in the right way, in the way pleasing to you. And so much more can be said. But we use Ya Razak. O oh Allah, give us the risk which will benefit us in this life. Give us the blessing to know how to use that risk. And give us the mercy, the kindness to share what you have given us with others. Barakallah fikum, salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We'll go to take a few questions. Now, um, Yasin from Djibouti. Assalamu alaikum. Alan was silent. Sauda Khan has asked 
us to keep her in our duas as she's going through a tough test in life. We ask Allah to make things easy for you, inshallah. Sharif Ahmed asks, is it permissible for us to read your PDF books for free? Yeah. You have my permission. Of course, getting the books through the proper channels, etc., is better. But if that's all that's available to you, that's all that's accessible to you, then Go ahead and keep me in your du'as. Ah, uh, somebody's asking here a name too difficult for me to to pronounce. If I can say Katia Rehan, I guess maybe. Um, there's no reward in just reading the Quran if you don't understand it. This is a question. They said that even if you don't understand it, you get ten hasanat for each letter. Actually, Prophet Sallallahu said that, but you know. We have to keep in mind, who did he say it to? Was he addressing a, a bunch of non-Arabs who didn't understand a word that he was saying and he just said that to them? Or was he speaking to Arabs who understood what he was saying? That issue of reward being in every letter you, you read is an issue of encouragement for you to read. This is what the issue is. Because if you want to take it by the letter, okay, we have to read Alhamdulillah, and we say Alhamdu is what? Alif Lam Ha Mim Dal. That's Alhamdu. Lillah, Lam Lam Ha. You think that's of any use? That's useless. And that's literally following exactly what the Prophet said. But that was not what was intended. So we have to consider who he was speaking to. What was his intention behind what he said? So, of course, Allah rewards people according to their intentions. But we also have common sense. Allah gave us brains to use to understand you know we don't use it in the place of wahi guidance revelation etc but when we receive and accept and believe in that revelation we now have to use our minds to apply it anyway actually i have another program coming right up in a few minutes it's uh, from nigeria salam tv I think it will be streamed live from my Facebook also. So I think we'll have to uh, shut down here. And barakallahu uh, fikum. We hope to see you tomorrow. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdika. Ashadu wa la ilaha ila ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu alaikum.